Hey there, Dr. Mamina here. Do you know what type of acne you have? And more importantly, do you know what might be triggering your breakouts? I wanna help you understand what the different types of acne means, what causes them, and how you can effectively manage and treat them with some of my dermatologist recommended products. Let's get into it. What exactly is acne? Okay, so acne forms when you have clogged pores. So pores are also known as your hair follicles, just without the hair. And acne can affect anyone at any age from teen years to adulthood. Your pores can get clogged from a mixture of three different things. Okay, so there's an increase in oil production, a buildup of dead skin cells, and bacteria, specifically cutie bacterium acnes or C. acnes, which naturally inhabits our skin. A clogged pore is the buildup of dead skin cells and oil or sebum, and it's the basis of an acne lesion. They start like whiteheads or blackheads, but when they get inflamed and become larger, they turn more into a papule, pustule, or cyst. Acne is most commonly found on the face, forehead, more so in young people, I would say lower face, like in the beard area, more so in adults, also chest, shoulders, back. There's also different types of acne depending on how deep and inflamed it is. So let's break those down. So there are three different ways that you can categorize acne. So one, you can categorize them based on their physical characteristics and presentation. You can categorize them based on whether they're non-inflammatory or inflammatory. And then you can categorize them based on the demographics and who they affect. So first, when it comes to the physical characteristics of acne, we use certain descriptor terms to describe them. So there's closed comedones or whiteheads, open comedones or blackheads, papules, which are these inflamed bumps, cysts, which are kind of larger bumps, nodules, which kind of are similar to cysts. Blackheads are black because the pore is exposed to oxygen and the contents of the pore are oxidized, making them turn black. Papules are when smaller acne lesions get inflamed and you get some small red bumps. Pustules are when the small bumps develop pus. Sometimes people can get them confused with whiteheads. Whiteheads are mostly just white keratin with some oil or sebum. And like I mentioned earlier, I kind of lump nodular and cystic acne in one category. Some call it nodular cystic acne. Basically nodules and cysts, you can have deep pus filled cysts or inflamed nodules, which can be painful and they can cause scars without proper treatment. Nodules and cysts can sometimes be really hard to treat and can lead to persistent inflammation and scarring. And then you could also, of course, have cysts that are not inflamed. They are just large bumps that sort of like lay dormant under the skin. So comedonal acne is the formation of blackheads or whiteheads. They do not have inflammation. While inflammatory acne, these include papular, pustular, nodular, or cystic lesions that all contain inflammation. Lastly, acne can vary based on age, gender, and hormonal factors. Teenage acne is the classic presentation that affects the face and mostly the forehead, like I would say like the T-zone area, that's the classic teenage presentation. Then there's hormonal acne, and this primarily affects adult females who have this overproduction of sebum, it clogs their pores, there's also this cyclical nature with their periods. And also acne likes to favor like the lower part of the face. I call this the beard region where there are higher amounts of androgens. Because there's a cyclical nature to the acne where it usually flares before period or flares cyclically, um, we like to call it hormonal acne, but really all acne is hormonal. There's also adult male acne, which can be linked to hormonal fluctuations, which can be influenced by things like genetics, but also testosterone levels and other lifestyle factors. I tend to see more breakouts in men who work out a lot and maybe consuming more things like whey protein or taking testosterone supplementation. Okay, so aside from those key factors to determine the type of acne you might have, there's also acne mimickers, which are skin conditions that can really look like acne that can lead to some treatment challenges. And oftentimes people think they have acne and try all these over-the-counter things and their skin will just get worse. Okay, so fungal acne or pterosporum folliculitis is one acne mimicker that occurs when yeast kind of builds up in your hair follicles. They can look a lot like closed comedones, but what makes it different from regular acne is that Fungal acne can sometimes itch. And then also when they're inflamed, you could just see like a bunch of pink monomorphic bumps. So monomorphic means they all look very similar in size and shape. Fungal acne likes to occur on the forehead, chest, and back, but we can see it anywhere. Fungal acne responds differently to certain topical treatments. It responds better to things like ketoconazole, zinc, anti-dandruff shampoos. So something to keep in mind. And there's also a bunch of other conditions that look like acne, like rosacea, perioral dermatitis, there's bacterial folliculitis, milia, sebaceous hyperplasia, miliaria, which is a heat rash. Then there's something called pseudofolliculitis barbae, which is like inflamed folliculitis and almost scarring keloid formation with shaving. And this can occur more often in darker skin types. Then there's angiofibromas. These are small little growths usually around the nose. These can all look like acne breakouts, but they truly are not. 
acne. So that's why it's so crucial to talk to your doctor or dermatologist if you're unsure about the type of acne you have or if your skin is not getting better with conventional acne treatment because you may not even be dealing with acne at all. You really just wanna make sure that you get the right diagnosis so that you can get the most effective treatment and then get the right tips to manage it. And some of the best ways to manage acne is to understand what's triggering it. So here are some of the most common triggers of acne we see. First, this is not really a trigger. We know that there's a huge genetic role with acne. People are more likely to develop acne if it runs in their family. About 80% of acne is attributed to genetics. So I think understanding your family history of acne can help you provide more insights into your own predisposition of acne. Then hormonal fluctuations probably are what is most responsible for acne breakouts and a lot of things can contribute to this. Fluctuations we see during puberty, menstruation, pregnancy, and in medical conditions like PCOS, these can all contribute to acne development. Hormonal fluctuations are natural, okay? We all go through puberty, but there are certain lifestyle factors that can actually make these fluctuations more pronounced. Stress can really trigger or accentuate hormonal fluctuations, and this can then lead to increased oil production and inflammation in the skin. When people are dealing with stress, I always like to advise patients about the importance of mindfulness, exercise, getting adequate sleep to really help mitigate those stress-related acne flare-ups. There are also studies showing that poor sleep can trigger acne. So really try to make sure you're getting at least six to eight hours a night, probably closer to the eight hour mark. If you wanna learn more about other ways stress can affect your skin, check out my video on stress and skin. Okay, so now getting back to acne triggers, diet. So this can be tricky for some people because some people can eat the healthiest diet and still have terrible acne. But for some people, diet can be very triggering. So things that can trigger acne include things like eating high glycemic index foods, dairy products, or processed vegetable oils. Dairy can increase something called insulin-like growth factor, and this hormone has a downstream effect on oil production in your pores. Sugar and processed oils can increase inflammation. Sugar has also been found along with, you know, dairy and increased oil production to make your keratin cells stick together more, or just be more sticky in the pores, and this can contribute to a more clogged pore. So watching your diet, and identifying these potential triggers can help you manage your acne symptoms more effectively. So I'm kind of briefly touching on all these triggers of acne, but I will actually be doing a deep dive on the root causes of acne, including all the genetic hormonal microbiome related causes. So stay tuned for that video. So one trigger could be wearing really tight fitting clothing and headgear like hats or helmets, and these can actually trap sweat and bacteria and kind of rub them against the skin, which then can lead to acne breakout. And then there's things like exposure to air pollution, which can affect your skin barrier function or exposure to certain weather conditions like high humidity, these can all exacerbate acne symptoms. And then there's the use of like personal care products, like really heavy ointments or creams that aren't made for acne prone skin. We also can see this with certain foundations. And if people use like really heavy products in their hair or along their hairline, like really like thick pomades, that can lead to breakouts, especially along the hairline or like on the back where the hair touches. So when you're looking for products to use on your skin, you wanna look for things that are non-comedogenic. These are less likely to increase breakouts. And then I think there's like more nuance with whether or not something's comedogenic or non-comedogenic, but in general, you wanna avoid things that are very occlusive that will clog your pores. Okay, there's also certain medications, including corticosteroid medicines, hormonal contraceptives, lithium, and I seizure medicines, these can exacerbate or induce acne. So if you suspect that your medication could be contributing to your acne, you definitely wanna consult with your doctor about alternatives. Okay, so lastly, picking or squeezing your acne lesions can definitely make inflammation worse and increase your risk for scarring. So please, 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 please try to resist the urge to pick your face because this is only gonna make your acne worse and your scarring worse. Also, please remember to wash your pillowcases regularly, I would say like once a week. Just being aware and addressing these triggers can help you be more proactive in taking the steps to manage your acne and promote clearer, healthier skin. But along with knowing to avoid these triggers, there's also so many great treatments out there. Treatment options can vary depending on the severity of your acne, your skin type, your individual needs, but I still wanna break down all the available options out there. Okay, so first there's your top topical treatments, both over-the-counter and prescription topicals. So over-the-counter topical treatments are generally the first recommended treatment I give for mild to moderate acne. These include things like salicylic acid, which I think is great for oily skin, for whiteheads, for blackheads. Then there's azelaic acid. Typically over-the-counter, you'll find a 10% strength. I like azelaic acid if you deal with a lot of redness with your acne or if you have like post-inflammatory red marks from acne. Then there's benzoyl peroxide, which is a huge favorite of derms. I like this one if you have really inflamed acne bumps or pustules. And then there's adapalene. The over-the-counter strength is 0.1%. 
I think everyone should be on a dapplein or some kind of retinoid, regardless of what kind of acne you have. And then there's sulfur. So this one's getting to be a little bit more popular. I think it's great for inflamed acne and those who deal with more redness. Glycolic acid, I do like this. And azelaic acid for people who are pregnant, glycolic acid also helps with exfoliation. Oftentimes in acne products, you will often see glycolic acid combined with salicylic acid. Then there's other ingredients like zinc and niacinamide. I think that these aren't like main acne actives, but I think that they can support your acne clearance and they can be used in conjunction with other ingredients in a skincare product. Then there are the prescription topical treatments if you have more severe or stubborn acne. These include retinoids like tretinoin, tazeratine, adapalene, the 0.3% strength. And then there's also triferritine, which is the newest class of retinoids. Azelaic acid in the 15 to 20% range. There's clindamycin, which is a topical antibiotic. And then there's dapsone, which has kind of more anti-inflammatory properties. And then topical minocycline, which is also a topical antibiotic, but is used more for its anti-inflammatory properties. There's a foam version of that. And I will share how to incorporate all these topical meds into a basic skincare routine in just a little bit. There are also oral medicines for moderate to severe acne that might not respond to topical treatments alone. The most common oral medications for acne are isotretinoin, aka Accutane, antibiotics like doxycycline or minocycline, and then meds that address the hormonal aspect of acne like spironolactone and birth control pills. Isotretinoin is reserved for moderate to severe acne or nodular cystic acne, scarring acne, or acne that's unresponsive to other treatments. And honestly, it does a really, really good job at clearing up acne. I do like a whole deep dive on isotretinoin, what to expect, side effects, tips to avoid side effects in a whole nother video. So make sure you check that out. Now, when it comes to antibiotics, I think derms are actually using less and less because we are seeing more long-term consequences of long-term antibiotic use. If I do prescribe antibiotics, I prefer to prescribe like a low dose of doxycycline more for its anti-inflammatory effects than for its antibacterial effects. When it comes to hormonal treatments, oral spironolactone is often prescribed for adult female acne or hormonal acne. I have found this to be so helpful. And I think so many derms will agree with that. Birth control is another common treatment for hormonal acne, but I, I actually prefer spironolactone because I think it works better and I think that it is safer, but different strokes for different folks. In addition to topical and oral medicines, there are also other treatments that can complement acne therapy like lasers, the main one being AviClear. So AviClear is an FDA approved laser that treats mild all the way up to severe acne. And it has like this unique laser technology because of the wavelength that it uses that selectively targets the oil glands or the sebaceous glands in the skin. Um, in addition to this laser, there's also photodynamic therapy or PDT, which can target acne causing bacteria. It can reduce inflammation and promote skin healing. And then of course you can do things like chemical peels with ingredients focusing more on salicylic acid and glycolic acid. These can exfoliate the skin, unclog pores, improve overall skin texture and tone. I also love recommending supplements for acne. We still need more studies to support their use, but there definitely is a role for them in people who really want to avoid prescription medicines or who aren't getting the full results they want with prescription medicines. I think that supplements can provide a more holistic approach because they can potentially address more underlying factors that could be contributing to your acne, whether it's inflammation or hormonal imbalances. I often recommend probiotics, especially those with strains that target acne. My favorite brand is Serene Skin, which you can get from microbiomelabs.com. If you wanna get it though, you have to have a code. I do have an affiliate code. It's my last name, Teregano. I'm also a fan of oral zinc, as well as oral niacinamide. They have some anti-inflammatory effects and there are some interesting yet small studies to support their use. And then there's something called DIM or D-I-M, diendyl methane. And that is something I like for those who deal with signs of estrogen dominance. So things like notable PMS symptoms or breast swelling or headaches. We can often see this in people with hormonal acne. I'm also a fan of pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5 and L-carnitine for teenage acne and acne in males. And then I'm also a fan of oral pumpkin seed oil for adult female acne. For those struggling with PCOS, I'm a fan of something called Vitex or Chaseberry. I'm going to do a deep dive into acne supplements in another video, so stay tuned for that. Okay, so when it comes to your skincare routine to help your breakouts and promote clear, healthy skin, this is just a simple over-the-counter routine you can follow. Okay, so for your morning routine, I recommend starting with a gentle cleanser and then following that with a product containing some kind of anti-acne active ingredient, whether it's a benzoyl peroxide product, salicylic acid product, or azelaic acid. Okay, so you're gonna apply that to your skin and then you'll finish with a sunscreen moisturizer. Okay, now at night, 
After you rinse your face, I recommend applying a Dapoline or some kind of retinoid. I prefer Dapoline if you're gonna go with an over-the-counter retinoid. And when using retinoids, you wanna make sure that you're starting every other night or even a couple nights a week to make sure that it's not gonna irritate your skin or overly dry your skin. And it's just a pea-sized amount to your whole face. And then you're gonna finish with a moisturizer. Some people may wanna include some kind of anti-acne wash. Um, as part of their nighttime routine, you can certainly do that, whether it's a benzoyl peroxide wash or a salicylic acid wash. I don't recommend introducing too many active ingredients at once. You can start with a dappling at night and one active ingredient in the morning. And if you need to, you can add another active at night. I'm tagging a ton of my favorite beginner acne products and acne emergency treatments in the description below for you to check out. But overall, understanding the different types of acne and their triggers is essential for effectively managing your breakouts. By identifying the specific characteristics of your acne and addressing underlying causes, you can follow a personalized skincare routine tailored to your skin's needs. And remember, consistency is key when it comes to treating your acne, so be sure to stick to your skincare routine and be patient. And as always, if you're unsure about which products or treatments are best for you, please don't hesitate to ask your dermatologist. I hear so many people talk about how it's hard to get in with a derm, the wait time is so long, but also there are so many online dermatologists with really quick turnaround service, so you might wanna look into that too. I hope you found this video on the different types of acne to be helpful and basic ways to treat acne. If you enjoyed this video and you wanna learn more about skincare, be sure to download my free gift, my top five skincare favorites. And remember to hit that like button, share this video with your friends, and subscribe to my channel to start your holistic wellness journey for your mind, body, and skin. Thanks for watching.